leaves his computer, <laughs> goes into a tackle shop, and whatever tackle shop is near where you fish, if they are worth a darn, they will have a type chart that says what their hours are, etc. The neat thing about this is we'll talk about it. So if you've got one of these, you're good to go. The second thing is those are free. These are free at every tackle shop going, Walmart, etc. You can pick these up. The neatest thing about this is inside the package, they're updated every six months by the Board of Fish and Wildlife Commission. And inside, it shows you the fish, it tells you if the season is open, it tells you what the bag limit is and what the, the number is that you can keep, and it's very informative. What I did in my youth is I got this and then I put it in my bucket. The problem is when the, the mist came in at five o'clock in the morning and I'm skipping around because the no seams are attacking my ankles, this turned into toilet paper. So the first thing you want to do is you go to Office Depot and you laminate them and then when it rains on them, they're waterproof. So anyway. So that's it. And then the final thing, which I would suggest to you, is if you're from this area, it's the Bavard County Coastal Angler Magazine. If you're down in Indian River, it's the Indian River Coastal Angler Magazine. And a lot of the local guides and fishermen put uh, reports in here, monthly reports. So I do too. And there's a surf fishing report. These are also free. So there's a great deal of free stuff floating around if you just know where to get it. But uh, you can't. We're going to talk about surf fishing today. But before we do, you'll say, John, what the heck do you know about surf fishing? Well, I got here from the Midwest, actually Northwest, Spokane, Washington. Uh, I got to Spokane, Washington by working at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota, and then March Air Force Base, California, then Spokane, Washington, and all of that came after four years in Vietnam and the Gulf of Tonkin, where I fished also off the back of the USS Providence uh, during the lull in our shooting. So I have fished in a great many places and had a lot of fun. But I rolled into this place in 1985 and I was working at Patrick Air Force Base and I couldn't believe it. I had a, finally had a job where I thought they were paying me what I was worth. I was with two between two bodies of water, a river on one side and an ocean on the other, and a clear water lake for bass fishing 20 minutes away, and I couldn't believe how they threw me in the briar patch and I didn't say a word for the next 22 years. <laughs> People would say to my friends, hey John, I ran across this guy at a conference, he graduated with you from the University of Northern Colorado. I hadn't heard from you. I've been here, just having my head down and having a wonderful time. <laughs> and when I retired in 06, I didn't have anything else to do. And the houses still had some mortgage, so I started a business. Now I'll tell you up front, I don't pay my mortgage with what I make fishing. The only reason I charge to take people fishing is because that's the way I keep score. Okay, at the end of the year, if I pay for my liability insurance, if I pay for my taxes, if I pay for the Bavard County taxes, the Indian Harbor Beach taxes, and I pay for my CPR training, etc. and so forth, and there's a couple of couple of grand left over. <coughs> That's when I spend $500 and go to Mosquito Lagoon with guides that I know and let them push me around for a day searching for redfish. So that's the whole ball of wax to right now, here we are. And I am the owner and operator of J&H Surf Fishing. 
one of only three surf fishing guides on this coast. There's uh, one in Cocoa Beach that's run out of a rental store, and there's a fellow down near Vero, and I'm in the middle. And we've all been doing this, and it's been a lot of fun. I teach people how to fish. I have very little return business. People don't come back and say, oh, John, I want to go with you again, okay? <laughs> because they already know. In the four hours that we fish, they know what to do. So I'm going to kind of give you the fast and dirty today of what I saw when I got to Florida and how I learned and the, the things that I'll highlight to you are going to be those things that have worked for me over the years. They may not work for you. I love going fishing early morning. I like being there at 5 o'clock in the morning. I like doing my no-see-em dance, okay? I like all that stuff. I think it's great. Other people say, I'm getting up. I got kids to get to school. I got to shower and shave and look pretty. I got to put on my tie. I got to go. Can't do that stuff, John. And I don't want to go on the weekends because the places are packed. So obviously, that's not going to work. So you adapt by coming out and fishing at 5 o'clock at night, and you fish to 9 during the summer months, because a lot of people aren't there during the summer months. During the winter, we've got darkness, you know, at 5 and 6, so you're going to be a little, you're going to be a little taxed. And so you've got to drive a little farther. You, you're certainly not going to go to Satellite Beach, Indian Harbor Beach, or Cocoa Beach, in the middle of winter on a Saturday and expect that you're going to own the whole beach because there will be other people there too. So you need to adapt and that's kind of part of the fishing that we'll talk about today. So here's my business card. I have, I do not have any problems with people emailing me. If you email me and you ask for uh, two chapters out of book number four, of get learning how to surf fish, I am not going to sit there and type them and send them to you. Okay? You want to do that? Call me up on the phone. If you call me up on the phone, and I please, please, I'm 75 years old. <laughs> if you hang up, don't expect me to call you back because I don't want storm windows and I have hurricane shutters. Okay? So, so if you call, say, hey, I met you uh, November 5th, and you, you were talking about surf fishing, and I didn't understand what you said. My name is Fred, and here's my phone number. You call me. I'll do it. But if you don't say anything, but do that number, then don't expect anything. But I'm not being a snob. I just get regularly, I get eight to ten robocalls a day. I don't know how many of you all do, but if you get as many as I get, it's just total frustration, okay? So, there's a card, and on this, uh, on my website, there are videos on casting, there's videos on catching samples, there's all kind of stuff. Uh, if you all picked up one of these, these I get from Whitey's Bait and Tackle, they give me the old ones. So, this is not current, do not believe this, okay? I got to tell you, the people will say, well, I got that from the guy who said it was a pie chart. So, but you're looking at November, you're looking at August here, okay? So, we'll talk about that. This is the most important sheet. Kara likes this sheet. I like this sheet. You will learn to like this sheet. This sheet keeps us out of here by 8 o'clock tonight. Without this sheet, we could be here till 2 or 3 in the morning. <laughs> because I love to talk about surf fishing. Okay? And I would love to share my stories and hear yours. Okay? So this is going to keep me honest. And uh, we're going to go through this and hit each one of these topics as we go. This sheet is really cool. People come to me regularly and say, 
Once this little knob on the end of the rod, under the reel, I twist it, and then all of a sudden the handle will go frontwards and it'll go backwards. You know? And, and so if you know what you're looking at, then you can say, ah, that's the anti-reverse. Now the new pens don't have the anti-reverse. You know where the anti-reverse came from? It came from when they originally built reels, and you had your reel, and the reels didn't have drags, okay? So what you did, oh, yeah, there's one that doesn't have it. Anyway, what you did is, thanks. You get the heavy part. I'll get the light part. Thank you, sir. So, you can turn it backwards, literally. This only goes one way, it doesn't go backwards. The little drag knob, or the little uh, add a reverse, is lo lo located here in spot number four. And it's a little button, and when you hit that, you can actually turn it backwards. The reason was when the fish ran and you didn't let out any line, the line broke because there was no drag. So the drag was by releasing line, and you could literally unwind your fishing line. The only thing those anti reverses are good for is they have a little tiny um, silver spring in there that makes the anti-reverse work. And those rust out immediately. And now your reel won't work because it goes both ways. And it's... Long story short, if you buy a reel, don't buy one with an anti-reverse on it. It's no good and they're not used anymore. And I have several that I will sell you if you need to have one. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally found a fellow who was nice enough to put a screw where it was and then it fixed it where it only went one way. Hmm. Who is the guy? Yeah, anyway. So this is not, some famous uh, fishing guide's book of 900 of my famous knots, okay? Uh, and I have all these knots and I know them. I know two. I know a flinch knot, and I know a loop knot. The loop knot I use when I'm using lures, and I want the lure to be loosey-goosey in the water. And the clinch knot is when I tie my fishing line directly uh, to the swivel and my pompano rig. Other than that, I don't need to know much. I don't also need to have a light up here at five o'clock in the morning because I can tie this knot with my eyes closed or in the dark. So I would suggest to you learn some knots and then memorize them and then use those and you'll be fine. If you don't have a book, unbelievable, um, YouTube, how do you tie a dropper rig? There are 57 videos telling you how to do that. There are people using garden hoses showing you how to tie knots. And if you hear the people who are laughing, they're laughing because they've already seen it, okay? Or they're using heavy rope. And my point to you very simply is, is there's a wealth of information. You don't need to, you don't need to be there alone and not get it, okay? Uh, We'll talk about the equipment a little bit. So, let's talk. Here's the rod. You try not to throw these on the ground. You try not to let these fall in the water. You try to take them home at the end of the night and contrary to some fellows that I think very highly of, uh, you don't dump them in water, okay? You take, you take them and you take them apart like this and you put them against the wall, you tighten the drag, put them against the wall, you rinse them off, and you dry them off immediately, then you release the drag and store it in a cool, dry place. 
this rod, they no longer make that real. But just to give you an idea, it was just like it was bought. And all, it's, all I've done to it is clean it regularly every time I come back. So it takes me an hour to clean up four rods after every fishing trip. And then the other thing. Uh, John, John, do you use any soap when you're doing your reel? I don't. I know. Other people have said too. People also said use WD-40, all kinds of stuff like that. I just put the plain old water on there and wipe it off rapidly. Why do you tighten the drag and then hose it down? I tighten the drag so if there is water that gets on top of the reel, which it will, because you're 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 you know you don't have the you don't have, the, you don't have uh, the garden hose on sandblast. You have it on rinse, okay? Lightly, light shower, right? Rinse it off, dry it off. Then you take the drag back off. So if if you wiped off the water and there is some water in there, it will dry and it won't rust your washers. So when you pull on the fishing line, it comes out as opposed to chunk, 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 right? <coughs> Uh, let me talk about the bucket for a minute here. So, and then a rod and reel too. So, rods, 11 feet, 12 feet. <coughs> I can throw both of those the same distance. I do not throw at 75 these fishing rods. I don't cast to 125, 130 yards anymore. I get maybe 75, and I still catch fish every time I go, and I have a good time, and I don't fish the same spot every time. So a show of hands, when you get fishing, and you're down the beach, you put the bait on it, your first cast, where does it go? Far out as you can get it? Yep, sure. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. Far out as you can get it. Yep. End of the day, you go home, you haven't caught a fish. Okay? <laughs> old guy, 75 years old, throwing it up in the air. It's coming right down in front of him, <laughs> catching fish all day long. Because he's fishing in the trough. So you fish in different spots. And that will be one of the things we'll talk about today, is we'll try to fish in four different locations at the beach. Not one. And one is like my buddy who used to run the youth center at Patrick Air Force Base, and he was a tank, and he was as strong as a bull, and every time he cast, it was that way, as far and as hard as he could do it. Sometimes he caught fish. Many times he went home blanked. But he was still surf fishing and still loving it, and still doing it. But, by the look at your face, you know, there's some of you who are grinning back at me, and I'm grinning at you because I did it, okay? You know, you gotta, you gotta learn to prospect a little bit for your fish. Uh, the bucket, the bucket holds everything. I got to Florida here, I had a creel for fly fishing. I had a tackle box that opened like this, it has three drawers and has all the junk in the whole world in it that I used in the boat and for bass fishing and stuff like that. And you know that wave that when you're walking down the beach, the wave is not supposed to get to your brand new Adidas? <laughs> and it gets there and then you see people do this number, which I don't look graceful like that, okay? but. Uh, what happens is the minute that wave gets there to the ta to the tackle box, it fills up all the trays on this side and all the trays on this side, and immediately it starts to rust. I can guarantee you that our environment here on the coast is the worst in the whole world. I had I was in the recreation business at Patrick Air Force Base. I had playgrounds where the swings, the chains 
the mothers would call the front office and immediately start saying, my kids are coming home with bloody hands because the chains are all rusted and then, you know, and that would be like, the maintenance guy would come into my office and say, John, we put those things up uh, eight months ago. But the moisture coming off the ocean and the salt breeze was just rotting them away. And there was just no saving it. Playground equipment, slides, everything. So we wound up literally having to go and inspect playgrounds on a monthly, a monthly, monthly basis. So if it works like that, and those of you who are boat owners obviously know if you don't take care of the boat in the salt water, you know, it's not going to last more than a day or two. So, the bucket. Why the bucket? Because when that wave that's not supposed to get to you gets to you, it goes around the bucket and it doesn't fill up the bucket. But the tackle box gets loaded with water. So that's why the buckets came out. It wasn't because we're all a bunch of rednecks down here and don't, don't know what we're doing. It's because the bucket serves a purpose. So now I have a creel, I got a tackle box, and I got buckets. I may be the bucket king, okay? But you need the bucket. The bucket carries all of the equipment. Back to the rod. 11 or 12 foot, 20 pound test monofilament. I got a question. What, what color is that, that motto you have on there? Excuse me? What color is that motto you have on there? Oh, this is called high vids. Okay. I, Why is it eco with, with that not something like a blue, bluer color or a clear? Remember, remember me telling you about my age? Uh huh. Clear monofilament, I don't see anymore. Okay. Okay. High vids, I can see. So when I say, sir, you threw it off to the left. Go up to the top of the rod, follow the line, and you can see where it is. It's, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it works the same, doesn't affect the bite, doesn't do anything like that, but it helps the customer see the line, okay. in my case. Now, I don't know if red would work, okay? Never used it, or blue, or anything else. Uh, but I definitely know the clear doesn't. And so that's why the high is. Okay. I was just making a reference to the fish, if the fish could see the line. I don't know if they can or they can't. Yeah. Uh, remember it though, really affect the but the remember line. though, you have the high vis running down to a swivel that is all clear mono 25. So if this is in the water, and then the high vis is here, probably not going to affect the bank. Do you ever use braided? Uh, yes, because I'm worth it. <laughs> okay? No. And, I'm, and, I, and people ask, do you use braid? I love braid. I think it's great. You have to be a little careful with braid. You have to, you have to think about what you're doing. You just can't treat it like you treat mono, or you'll wind up with a whole bunch of wind knots. But it's very good. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely just what they say. It is super sensitive, and it will test you if you have to pull it off the rocks, okay? So if you're gonna pull it off out of the rocks, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a trip. So, so I find that the mono works well it's user friendly, and if you have to break it, you can wrap the line around the handle, that being the ocean, and it's stuck out there. You walk this way and you hear a snap, and it will normally break right down where the swivel is. And then you don't leave a lot of trash in the water, and, it, and it's there. So uh, that's why. Uh, I, I have friends who bought braid and put it on this uh, Fierce 7000. The Fierce 7000 
holds 330 yards of 20 pound high vis. It holds 580 yards of 20 pound braid. The braid is 22 cents the yard. The braid is more expensive than the reel. Okay? It, was one, it took me 10 years, but I figured it out. Okay? You know, so, so, and I teased because I did all this stuff. When I was learning, I, you know, I did it all backwards. Uh, and so you, you learn how to, how to handle that. The braid is nice. I use braid on my river fishing stuff. I like that, but I'm also not throwing out 75 yards of it. I'm throwing out about uh, 30, 40 feet, you know? And I'm casting and I'm reeling it in. So I'm kind of controlling the ability of the wind knots to attack me. Uh, rod, reel, bucket, sand spike. So I went to the store need something to hold your fishing rod while, while you're fishing because we don't necessarily hold these most times. And this goes in here. And the first time I got out there, I had one that I bought at Walmart that was about two and a half feet and it's about an inch and a quarter. And this will fit down in there and it's excellent. But then I had to go to the hardware part and pick up a rubber ball peen hammer because you can't push the, the, the sand spike into the ground because of the small diameter, it jams with sand. And so that's where you see people standing at the beach with mallets going, Banging these things. Yeah. You got one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Banging in the ground. So after another 10 years, <laughs> I figured out that a two inch thin wall PVC goes into the sand better, and you can put it in with one hand, and because of the large diameter, the sand goes up the tube as opposed to jamming. So I can hit this in the sand and go like this and I can literally feel it dig. And then I was, uh, I was beveling the tops of these because I could sell these to the fishing guys, right? They said, oh yeah, John, make me a couple of those. So I go and buy this stuff and make it for them. And I was taking a beer bottle that's the important part of this, because first, you have to empty the beer bottle. <laughs> so if you're making 10 or 12, you, you know, you might, you might want to buy a case, okay? But anyway, put the bottle in upside down, and it beveled it, but it didn't bevel it. What it did is it just pushed it straight up. So still, when you jammed your rod in there with the cork handle, it ain't the cork handle because it would be rubbing on the sides. So I learned how to bevel the tops and then set them up. And so I've been doing this for a long time and having a lot of fun with it. And uh, have some, some guys who come by and say, hey John, make me a couple of those. And I say, certainly be glad to do that. And they say, how do you bevel it, John? I said, am I selling these to you or teaching you? <laughs> <laughs> they get it after a while. <clears throat> they're, they're on their second 10 years, those guys. Uh -huh. Okay, so. This is what I tend to use. I tend to use three or two. I really like two hook pompano rigs. The reason is if you're not catching fish on two pompano hooks with baits, why put a third one down there that you're still not catching anything with? So use two. You can't catch fish on two, you can't catch fish on three. Second thing is, if you have two, it reminds you to 
use two different baits as opposed to one. So here is some fallacy. We get to the beach, we've got mullet, we're fishing for bluefish. So mullet goes on both hooks and we throw it as far as we can. Nothing happens. We go home, but we've spent, what, $4.99 per bag, right? And we got two bags, and you and the buds went together, right? And, uh, well, they weren't there today. Meanwhile, the little old 75-year-old guy throwing the screen up in the air, coming right down the trough, he's cleaning up on waiting. And he's using shrimp. So, you need the Pompano rigs, and those are as good as they come. And to hold the Pompano rig down, these are called Sputniks. The cheapest one on here of three is probably about two and a half at the strike zone. And the fellow who asked me where you could get them, strike zone, has got a whole bunch of these. These are the Pompano rigs. Threes, fours, and five. This is the basic. You don't need to use anything else. If you throw sixes, sevens, or eights, it's like throwing a hand grenade or a brick into the water. When it hits, it makes such a large splash, you don't know what's going on. Uh, the threes, obviously, for summertime. The fours and the fives during the winter. So, if you'll take that, pass it along, let it go. Same with you. These are called hurricane sinkers. They have the little groove around them. And we are led to believe that that will sit in the ocean floor and then yeah, right. <laughs> go, in, go into the ground. I'm not sure that works. But, you know, I'll tell you, one of these pompano rigs would, uh, would, what's another one of these wonderful fallacies? So you don't use the pompano rigs with the floats on have, have, okay, uh, and I'm not going to poo-poo that because I could be absolutely wrong, okay? And I may be absolutely wrong. My theory is if you put a sand flea, which is ultimately dead after you put the hook through it, right, on a papado rig with a little piece of styrofoam, your thought is that's going to lay there on the bottom of the ocean and it's going to float up like this. That's what you think. I bet if you put that in the sink and put some water in there, it would be more like that. So I, I'm not 100% for the floats, the styrofoam. Now there are bigger floats that are about so big. And I think that frightens the fish away, so I stay away from them. The little pieces, I think all you're doing is spending money. I think, I think. Could be wrong. I could be totally wrong. I just, just haven't done it. Okay? I did buy because I, I met a fellow who told me, and he had he had styrofoam that was that big that looked like a a a float. That he actually had the hook embedded in it. And uh, and then he he so I don't know if you can see this that much per, protruded out of the end of the styrofoam. Okay, so there you had to put your bait on there, right? Uh, what well, was a chunk of a piece of piece of float? All right. Um, Rod, real bucket, sand spike. Okay, so we talked about the sand. Oh, by the way, uh, thank you. Right. I'm going to hand out some other stuff, and I don't mind you look at it, touch it, smell it, do what you want. But it gets to the back of the room. If I don't find all my stuff at the end of the night, nobody's leaving here <laughs> until we have a full body cavity surgery. Okay? <laughs> so now we know another thing about the guy who's talking here. We know that he is mentally <coughs> fixated and, and he's weird, okay? 
I went to Sebastian Inlet and had a group like you guys who and gals who are smiling, we're having a good time, and I'm yucking it up, and I'm putting stuff out, and they're seeing it, and they're looking at it, and I, I can see from here, I can see people. And I'm watching this stuff. At the end of the night, I looked, and I was down three lures, one bait knife, and a couple of fishing rigs. And, you know, and like these kind of things. And, you know, just hand them around. You know, one over here, one over here, one over here. And, and I, don't know where, I don't know where this stuff went. You know, the rangers said they didn't steal it from me, which I thought was very gracious. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's just... It's just strange. So, anyway, I teased. Okay, this is another one of my inventions. I told you I lived in Indian Harbor Beach, Satellite Beach. I fished in Indian Harbor Beach and Satellite Beach for, oh, long enough to find out that I didn't like fishing over rocks. Okay? And I wound up paying the water guard in lead. And then I would go down on low tide and I'd watch those high schoolers from Satellite Beach High School go out and walk on the other side of the reef with their feet like this. And until they found the fishing line pull up, these guys were coming out with 50 bucks worth of lead. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> didn't help me. <laughs> so, uh, Why don't you use the cable hook and then a circle hook? Say again? Why don't you use the cable hook instead of a circle hook? I believe that the circle hooks work well using live bait, snook, redfish, stuff like that. I am not sure that fish running back and forth on the beaches, normally like marauders, right, wolves, whatever, that see something in the sand or floating in the water, attack and run. Circle hook's not gonna do any, any, any better than uh, the kale hook. And so I just, I just don't, I don't mess with it. Uh, a lot of people say, well, look at it. I pulled this in there. I did it in the mouth here. Well, great. The fish still bit it and ran and hooked itself. Well, they do the same thing with a kale hook. So I, I can't see it. I can't see something, that, a difference there. Okay. This is cool. So we got our bucket here, right? We got our stuff in our bucket and we got our... Right? And we got to have... Yeah, you're too late. You know I'm, I'm going to bite on that. Yeah, what, what's the satellite dish here doing on the bottom of the... <laughs> what's, what's the gizmachi here? I may tell you, and I may not. <laughs> there you go. No, I told you. I told you going in. That's another one of my inventions yeah. for fishing. Yeah. Uh, Satellite Beach. Okay. So, you have your knife. Okay? And you you have your knife, and if you're like me, when it's five brothers, you've gotten your official buck knife on your 35th birthday that has its own leather sheath, and it's got its own stainless steel blade, and it's got an ergonomic handle, and it's got all that wonderful stuff and it costs $49.95. <laughs> At the same time, when I was 30, they told me they couldn't talk to me anymore because I was too old. But anyway, when you put this in the bucket, where you have uh, the weights and all the other trash that you carry, you tend to mess up your blade. So off I went to Lowe's, and I bought a piece of PVC. Then you have to drive around the neighborhood for several months until you find someone who's thrown out their couch. <laughs> you take the cushion and you cut the cloth off it and you wind up with this stuff. You put that 
in one end. You put a cap on the end. You have this cap and you notice the red rubber band? That's for idiots who don't know which end to take off, okay? <laughs> then you take your knife, you put it in there, and it doesn't get off. Doesn't get that. You do the same thing, <coughs> only I don't have a red one here. Works every time now. And you put the bake knife in there. And so the bake knife doesn't get, it also gets clean. So at the end of the night, it comes home, it gets washed off, rinsed off, gets dried, gets pretty, gets put in, and with the little uh, rubber stuff at the bottom, it doesn't bottom out on the hard PVC. Close, right? Sir? Close. No, no. No, no. So you can pass that one along. You can pass this one along. <coughs> Be careful. Uh, the, the, the black knife. Ah, so uh, everybody's local, right? I mean, Cocoa Beach, you know, Melbourne, right? What? But we come over. <laughs> I just know that name. I have no idea where it is. I once left the beach. I left the beach a couple of years ago, went to the mall, didn't like it, haven't been back. <laughs> uh, so, the, the knife. The knife you're looking at came from the local uh, flea market. Now, I would suggest you go buy one of those Cadillacs in the back. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> However, comma, if you are strapped for dough, you can get those at the flea market for five bucks. Those knives have come from a meatpacking place where the butchers cut meat all day long. At the end of the night, they put their knives on the table. Someone comes in later on and re sharpens them, and they are left for the butchers the next day to operate with. Ultimately, they get down where they won't keep an edge anymore. So what happens? They go in a bucket and they're sold at auction. Other people with grinders buy them and grind them down. So now I've got a rubber handled fillet knife that is stainless steel and has all kinds of flexibility to fillet a fish with, and it costs five bucks. Hmm. I haven't used the buck knife in years. It's in a closet, though. Yes, sir? On your PVC pipe, don't they get a lot of salt in there? Mm -hmm. Knife in and out, in and out, in and out, while you're using it? No, I don't. I pull it out, and it's out through the whole day. Thank you, my dear. It's out through the whole day. At the end of the night, it stays out in the bucket that had the bait in. It goes home, it gets washed, it gets dried, and then it goes back in. So your knife still is getting yes. tossed around while you're using it, yeah. Yeah. But I don't, I, it's not, you know, there's more than one bucket out there. There's a bucket that has bait in it. There's a cutting board, right, that you have. So I'm cutting and I'm laying it down, right, so it's not banging around. And then when I go home, you know, I clean everything, put it back. So this, there's my two hook pompano rig. Obviously, those are bits of fish bites. You know, I think you all know fish bites, but I'll talk a little bit about them. Here's the three-out sinker. This goes out in the water. Bunk, okay? Now, you are back here on the beach. You have your fishing rod up here. And your fishing rod, the line is taut going into the water. And you can't see any more than that. You can only see where it goes in the water normally over the waves that are breaking on the beach. Well, that's not the slide for life, okay? This rod would have to be higher than the building to make this slide all the way down to the bottom. So what happens is this is laying flat. And if you're fishing in Satellite Beach, Indian Harbor Beach, uh, where there's a reef, your fishing line is laying over the reef. It's not 
going like this down, and lay it open. As you start to reel this in, you can't reel fast enough to make this float. A chunk of weight, you're not gonna make that float. You'll be able to pop the rod, yeah, but that's all you can do. But, so as you reel in, As you reel in, this is coming along, it's going over the reef, goes over the reef, until the reef is, is above the ground, okay? And then it swings into the reef. Now you've got a hook, and you've got the rest of it to hang up there. With this on, you go up to your rod, you set the hook, like you were catching a fish, and that dislodges the weight from the sand. As you start reeling in, if you can see, the weight holds down, but the plastic bends. And now I got a surfboard, and it's bringing the weight up to the surface, and it brings it in over the rocks, and to me. Or if there's a fish on there, the fish isn't digging down into the reef, he's coming over the top because he's being pulled up to it. And as hard as the weight or the fish pulls down and you're pulling over here, that's just adding to the, the bend in this plastic. 10 years, about a 10 years here. So, I hope you enjoyed that. That's, that was one of the things along with the, um, with the sand spikes that really made my fishing a lot more fun. So, as I said in the beginning, everything, I learned what I learned from the guys that I met, and then I started adapting it for things that I needed, because I couldn't afford to lose 40 bucks worth of lead every time I went fishing. Yes, ma'am. Over there. Over there. Yes, ma'am. From the they, fish. <laughs> well, I, if they're the coming fish. out from the fish, then God bless you and keep doing what you're doing. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, okay. if they're coming out because they're falling over, no. No. all right, what happens is this will go in. This one, I can get it in about that far with one hand, one arm. And that's not because I, I, I'm You're 23. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> but that's just doing this. That's what it said. Goes down about that. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't have to. Doesn't have to be way up here. You know, so it's not. You know, it's not that. Now, if it's in the ground and it keeps falling over, then you're not getting it deep enough. Okay. But you don't necessarily have to put it in the hard sand back there. You know, when the waves come in and they come up the beach, to the top of the water. fishing at Patrick. He uh, had the sand spike, take the drag down on this fish line, put it in there. Fish took it, came right out of the, the sand spike because the sand spike was aimed like this, a little bit like a rocket launcher on the fourth of the I'm not having much luck today, you know? Anyway, like this, <laughs> it was right out. Going down the beach, he's telling this story to a bunch of us at, uh, at the club. He's chasing it down. The guy next to him has got a better story. <laughs> he's fishing, same thing, things like this. The rod goes flipping out in the water. He chases it to the water, but then can't get it. High tide. He calls me at home because he was one of my students. He calls me at home and says, John, I just lost one of the outdoor wrecks um, of fishing rods and reels. And of course, I helped him by saying, man, you screwed up. That's about 180 bucks, you know, uh, that you owe. And uh, he said, he said, well, what do you think we ought to do? Well, after thinking about it a little bit, we agreed that 
he might be able to find it if, if he went back on low tide. So he said, I think I'll go back on low tide. And we were talking at 1 o'clock, and it was like 6 o'clock low tide. He goes back to the beach. And those of you who may know where Patrick Air Force Base is, there was a great big hangar that was right on the other side of the fence. And right in front of that, in the old days, there was a pier when the Navy owned the base that ran straight out in the water about 100 yards and had a T on the end of it or something. And Hurricane David blew it, <coughs> blew it to hell. When the, the hurricane blew, blew through here many, many years ago, 80, early 80s. Anyway, so um, he went back there, and the fishing rod was stuck in the rocks <laughs> like that. And he said he walked out to it, pulled it out, still had the line on it. Everything was fine. He went down, caught them before they closed, gave the rod, said it fell in the water. They said, fine, you take your <laughs> That was the end of that. But no fish. <laughs> and the Nestor guy didn't have any fish either. Yeah. John, what uh, what weight is your rods? Are they heavyweight, lightweight, or no, no? This this is a twelve foot rod, and it's a little heavier. Yeah. Okay because this is a bigger reel. This is 7,000, 10 beer, 7,000. A 20 pound test line, but if you look, it's fairly medium heavy, yeah. okay? Yeah. Where, <coughs> this guy, 11 feet, smaller reel, and it's got a little bit more to it, mm -hmm. a little more snap to it. The stiffer the rod, the more user-friendly it is because you don't have to wait on it. When a rod has a lot of a lot of bend to it, you when you cast the rod, the rod has to load, right? We've heard those words before. Yeah. Load. So here's the rod. We're up here. We're casting. Literally, the rod kind of does this. As this comes over, it releases and goes out. Okay? A stiffer rod, you can just muscle that. So it's more user friendly. If you have a 15 or 16 foot rod that's got a little looseness to it, then you literally have to wait for that to catch up with you before it goes. You understand? I understand. It's tiny. This is more tiny. I have some old guy, did lot surf fishing, said the mistake we're all making is we don't have a light enough rod. We should have the lightest rod we can use for surf fishing. You have more? I don't have a thought on that. I would love to tell you I know what the hell I'm talking about, but I don't. I don't know. Uh, no, I just, I just don't know. I, it, yeah. You know, it very well may be absolutely the right thing to do. I have friends who fish with 15-pound test fishing line because they believe they can cast farther with the lighter 15-pound test fishing line. And they won't go to break because they're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes more sense. What you said. That makes sense. You know, yeah. uh, but... Uh, but for, for me, it's a... Uh, Sounds like it's about medium weight. I'll tell you what. December's Coastal Angler Magazine. You look at it, and you find the John Detmer fishing report, right? And you look at the five foot one, 77-year-old woman who I took fishing last Saturday, five one, I look like I'm tall next to them. Okay. Using this rod, almost pulled her over, and she wriggled in a, a, a 16, 
the 60 pound, uh, 16 inch uh, uh, bluefish. Huh. Which is one of the Yeah. But the, the rod was too heavy for her, yeah. so we had to find a lighter rod for her, which I did. And uh, now hooked with going down to her house and showing her how to use it. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> no, she's a nice lady. Come on now. Tommy, let's. John, how much are you looking at uh, to spend for a decent rig like that? Walmart has, you think, you think I had stock in this company. Uh, Walmart has Andy. 12 foot rods for $54. And you can probably get that Ben Fierce 7,000 or Ben Fierce 6,000 for about 80. So, so you're right in there, uh, you know, 120, 125, 30, something like that. And, uh, and that's not a bad time. Now, those of us who were a little more frugal 22 years ago or longer in 1985, who had a lovely wife who lived in Spokane, Washington in my house with my two children, who I supported from here with alimony and child support. I bought most of my stuff at garage sales. And I will tell you, there is some good stuff at garage sales if you like to go and if your significant other, whoever that may be, likes to go too. Because you can find a reel that's a pen reel or something like that that's worth $125, $130. And by putting in and buy it for, for 10 or 15 and uh, and then take it to a, a real repair shop, and for 30 or 40 bucks, you got a brand new piece of equipment. I had a research librarian at Patrick Air Force Base, name was Frankie. Frankie was a, a hoarder, lived right next door to me uh, in Indian Harbor Beach. And Frankie would go out every, she went out earlier than I went out fishing. She would be there when people came out to pick up their paper in their bathrooms. She was waiting for them to open the garage so she could get in there. Mm -hmm. And she would get this stuff and then bring it home. And it all came home. So I started showing her a picture of pen reels. And I showed her a picture. I said, you see this one? You turn the handle, and if the handle moves and everything, and it's under $30, buy it. She said, well, I need to call you, don't I? She stocked me in equipment for a number of years. <laughs> <laughs> and the other woman in Spokane got the other part. <laughs> so, the Papano rigs. Another, another operation there. Knots, same knots. Clinch knot to the swivel. Uh, a loop knot if I'm using lures. But that's another type of surf fishing that we're not talking about today. We're talking about this kind of surf fishing, which is more cast out, let it soak, sit in your lawn chair, soak up the rays, watch the joggers come by, and try not to hook the little kids that may be at the beach or that, you know? And that's the fun part of this stuff. And now, older, used to be, I'd go to the beach and I'd fish, I'd fish for eight hours, and I went home I didn't remember anything that happened around me except fish. I mean, I locked in, and I'm now I'm older, and I teach people, and they go fish, and they're having a good time, and I'm sitting back in a lawn chair saying, oh, look over there, the birds are diving. Oh, look at the cruise boats going out of the cave, you know? Oh, look at it, here comes some guy in a parachute with a, a propeller on the back of it, you know? And I'm seeing all of that stuff now that used to get with osmosis. 
No, I'm, no more smokes. And now I'm actually enjoying it. <laughs> so there's a lot there, and, uh, and I suggest to you to enjoy it. Okay, last little bit here. So again, you know, started having trouble with knives. Had knives all over the place. Uh, one day down at the the inlet and uh, tied a knot and have the little line left over, right, the better end, and bite it in my teeth, take the knife, go like this, and lick my nose. <laughs> then I found these guys. 98 cents at Harbor Freight. <laughs> Can't go wrong. <laughs> if you lose them, you can not care. <laughs> uh, my sunglasses that I didn't bring with me cost $11.95 at Walmart. They got little glued on cheaters, okay? I don't care. I don't have the three hundred dollar glasses down there, right? Three hundred dollar glasses in the car. This is the coolest guy in the world. How many of you have seen people on TV fishing shows of people catching tarpon and they're over at Boca Raton and they get the and the captain has the Boca grips, which are the stainless steel grips, and he reaches down and he hooks them on the jaw. And he's got this rope that's in through a great big uh, float. <laughs> so if he drops them or the fish shakes them out of his hand, they don't drop the 15 feet down to where all the sharks are going, God damn, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and it's just a, this, thing, this guy comes out. This is called a fish grip. Fish grip goes in the fish's mouth and you go like this and now you got it. This floats doesn't need a great big old buoy on the end of it. It's not stainless steel so it doesn't weigh a whole bunch. You can buy them any place. Strike Zone, Walmart, Target, whatever. They are plastic and they do everything in the world. So, when the tiny little lady, I forget that's a recorded. Okay. <laughs> when the smaller human <laughs> catches a fish, okay, you give them, and that's only a little tiny fish, you give them the small reps, and it looks big. If they catch a big fish, you use the bigger grips, the daddy grips. I'm not talking to you guys anymore. A <laughs> uh, couple more things. So, here again, now we're talking frugal, right? Here's the tape measure. Went and got this, went this to, to uh, Lowe's, $8.95, right? Hot damn, got my own tape measure. Or you could go to Walmart and go to the back of the store where they have the fabrics. And if you look on the shelf, you will see uh, a red, a yellow vinyl tape measure that every woman who has ever sewed in her life, or every man who has ever sewed in his life, has. And there is a tape measure that's vinyl that is six feet long. If you cut it at 36 inches, roll it up and throw it in your bucket, that only cost you $1.85 and you still got one left. You put it down, you put the greasy old fish on top of it, and you get the measurement, and then when you go home, you take a wet rag and like this, and now it's nice and clean and ready to go. These were another, these were a garage sale deal. And this was some guy's uh, stuff, and, and basically they were, they were shiny and they stayed shiny, so I immediately saw them. And I'm into shiny. I got lots of reels that are shiny. This is cool. This is uh, this is for those of you who are having a little problem letting go on time. So remember we talked about loading the rod. So we got the rod bent. We're coming, we're holding the fishing line here, and we get there, and we don't let go of the finger, and all of a sudden, it comes, pulls right off the edge of the finger. 
That's the other reason you don't want to use brake. It, it takes the finger with it. But <laughs> anyway, so you have this glove if you're a delicate person like I am. And uh, my son chewed me out so many times I can't wear it. So it's now a display thing. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, Guy Harpy? Yes, sir? Do you buy it like that or did yeah, you yeah. get her a yeah, yeah. full I'm glass sorry. of I beg your pardon. <laughs> it's called an aqua skin. Aqua skin. Find it on a computer. Put your finger in it. Rub parts here. Smooth parts here. Got a little Velcro thing comes around your wrist. You go like that and you're all set. Yeah, you could use your regular glove and cut it. You could. Uh, the problem is that this one is is for people who really have trouble letting go on time, you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's built for that. You might tear up a glove pretty quick. My son's got some fire gloves in her. Oh, okay, well, maybe they are resistant. Yeah. Uh, Guy Harvey, know about Guy Harvey? Guy who does shirts and everything? Big environmentalist, <clears throat> lives down in the Keys. He created this thing. This is called an ARC dehooker. And the ARC dehooker, this is the fish. This, you're now Robin Hood. You ready? This goes on the bow, you make a quarter turn, you run it down to the shank of the hook. This hand goes to two o'clock, this hand is eight o'clock, you pull your hands apart, the fish falls right down there in the water. Coolest thing in the whole world. Never touch the fish. This is the medium sized one. They have another one that's about this big, 36 inches, and that's for sharks and other fish with big teeth. And then they got a short one that's like about that big. But if, if the fish is there, you put it on the line, you run it down to the fish hands to Nate, pull them apart, if the fish is eating the hook and it's down his throat, you do the same thing, you have it together, you put both hands together and you go like that and it pops off. And what happens is the shank and the hook bend along the same lines as the, as the, uh, the little pigtail here. And so instead of being you know, perpendicular to it, it gets like so. If you catch that up with the little piece of plastic paper, the, who's got that? Yeah, if you can get, yeah, we can just pass those along together, and then it'll probably make more sense. Okay, four types of bait. Sand fleas, clams, shrimp, and mullet. Okay, sand fleas, clam, shrimp, and mullet. Mullet for the bluefish, <coughs> sand fleas for the papano, uh, shrimp for the whiting and the drum and the sheep's head. Clams works with all of them. Uh, I usually try to take one or two bait, two or three baits when I go fishing. And we'll get to that over here where we sit, talk about how to fish, where to fish, and when to fish. So, seasonal fish in the winter time, which I consider October, November, December, January, February, March. The winter months, we see bone, the bluefish, papano, drum, whiting, flounder, and sheephead. So there's sheephead out there, flounder, whiting, drum, papano, and bluefish. In the summer months, if you've all been out there at all, we have the whiting, the tarpon, the snook, the redfish, and sharks. And even last Saturday, the guy I was fishing with pulled in his uh, baby papano, and it was just a half a fish, and we could actually see the cut line of the shark that, that bit it right off. And so, you know, all of a sudden we became uh, CSI, NCI, whatever. <laughs> we became forensic scientists. We can see the bite ratio, you know, and all that kind of stuff. 
Anyway. All right. There are three. Oh, let me ask you a question. Ask you a question, and we'll do the last three things here. Anybody has a question? You can ask. And Car has things for a raffle here. Uh, so fish. Why do fish attack a bait? They're hungry. Okay. Anything else? idea. He called it the 3S system. And I suggest it to you as one of those things that you remember and think about, and it will be on the final exam. <laughs> okay. 3S. Fish attack. Sight, sound, and smell. 3S's. Anytime you can put two or three of those things together, you got a better chance than he has if all he has is the scent of a sand leaf. But if you have a sight and a sound and a smell, you have a better chance. And so that would be one thing that you would consider when you went fishing. The other thing you would consider prior to going fishing is you consider where you were going to fish. Was it going to be a sandy bottom? Was it going to be, uh, well, try this. Was it going to be Daytona Beach, where people drive on the beach and you can actually walk out in the water about a half a block if you're still waist deep? Okay. Or are you going to be down near Sebastian Inlet, where you walk into the water and the water's up here? And those are the things that, that you would want. But, those are locations that we would fish. So when I go fishing, I'm prospecting. And I'm taking my three baits. I am trying to use those on different boats. I have figured out which of the customers can cast far and which don't have the range. And so then I'm figuring out who's going to throw it in the trough, who's going to throw it at the sandbars, and who's going to throw it at holes? So when I stand on the crossover and I'm looking out at the water, I see that all the surfers in the whole world are right here where the waves are breaking. But for some reason, they're not over here. And the waves aren't breaking. Why aren't they breaking? Because the water is deeper there. And the waves fall over when the water gets shallow. So when all the surfers are telling me that water's shallow there, so probably over here the water's deeper. Now it may only be two feet deep, but it's still deeper. And fish do find a level. So I look for troughs. Trough, or I look for the bar. And the bar, when I say bar, I'm not talking about the sandbar with the, the sandbar where the wave breaks. If we look at that sandbar and we see nothing but brown around it, the brown is the sand that's blown up, right? In the sand, worms, bugs, things to eat. Where are the fish? The fish aren't sitting here getting hammered by the wave. The fish are here, waiting for this stuff to percolate down. So, they can. so if I have a customer, I'd say fish in front of the sandbar or beyond the sandbar, not on the sandbar. Holes, all you gotta do is look out there. You see blue water, you see no waves, gotta be depth. Gotta be depth. Are there fish in there? Uh, runouts is the way word I was given in 1985 by the old scrupties that I went with, wound up running with. But uh, runouts are the same word as rip current. We've all heard that, we all know that. And the rip current is an 
is when the waves are coming in and breaking on the beach, and there's a lot of them, and you can see this wave to this wave, it's not any 15 seconds, it's like about six to five. And what happens is the water builds up, keeps coming in, keeps coming in, and pretty soon, that has to release because the pressure, it's not a tide, it's not going up, it's just pushing in, and that water is going to push out. And when water pushes out, it's going to find a valley in the sand on, just as you look down the beach, and if you look down the beach to the right or left, you probably see little sand dunes like this. Not big dunes, but you know, little hills and valleys. Well, same thing underneath the water, hills and valleys. That water's going to find one of those, and everything's going to go. It's just going to be like uh, men in black. They're going to get flushed, okay? And all that water goes out there, and what happens is the fish line up on the sides because it's a smorgasbord. The bait comes floating out. Everything does because it's the whole water column from the ground to the top of the water all moves. It's not like a an undertow if we're if you're from the Midwest, it's, it's, it's actually a massive move of water. And so any, any bait fish that are in there are just carried on because that's moving at five or six knots and it's going straight out as far as it goes. So the fish are all in there and the fish that are predators are lined up on the sides. And you can feel it on the back end of the pyramid sinker, and you can feel the water pressure pushing on the back of the, in front, oh, you can feel it pushing on the back of the pyramid. The water is pushing so hard, you can actually lift it up and let it come down, you can, because the water is not letting it sink and get into the sand, it's just holding it there. Holes, runouts, uh, rip currents. Uh, I um, unfortunately I am reporting that when I find a rip current, I normally blunder into it. Okay. However, come on YouTube, there are a number of different videos by a number of different men who who talk about a rip current and how it happens and how they see it. I normally see it by seeing water moving the wrong way. A lot of waves are breaking and there's a lot of white water here. And all of a sudden there's white water here, but this water doesn't seem to be staying. It seems to be moving the other way. That's kind of an indication. Remember we talked, it's not just the bottom, it's the whole water column that's moving the wrong way. And that's, and that's how I see it. So four places to fish, four types of bait, and now, how to fish. Now we're back to the beginning. Everybody throws it to the, the bleacher, right? Now you know something different. Now you know that maybe one person puts shrimp and clams on and throws it in the trough, and the other guy throws beyond the salmon. And maybe shrimp and clams in the trough, but you're using mullet beyond the sandbar. And all of a sudden, you catch something on mullet beyond the sandbar. Look. Okay, everybody reels in, do it again. Mullet past the sandbar, bang, another bluefish. Third time out, everybody's got bluefish on, and everybody's throwing it to the bleacher. Four. Everybody's throwing it in the trunk. And this happens with me, just by natural selection. If I have three or four people that I'm fishing with, some people are better than others, some people throw it farther, some people throw it shorter. I just remember what they have on. And then when they reel it in, oh, look at it, red color fish. And I said, red, can't, can't pass the trunk. You know, <laughs> because our red's fishing in the trunk, and that's what we get to pass. That works. Finally, when to fish. 
You'd never guess that I would write down here any time. Okay. I like to check the water temperatures. I like to check uh, the tides. I prefer to go fishing with the tide coming at me. So if I'm going for four hours of fishing, I'd like to get there at seven o'clock in the morning, warm up from seven to eight, eight to nine, have the high tide at nine o'clock, and have two hours after that, 10 and 11, because the high tide's only gonna last there about 20 to 30 minutes. And then it's gonna start up. And the fish will move around during the tides. With the wind and blow out the producers. So you may, uh, you may want to consider that. Last story, and then we're done. Uh, barometer, okay? The barometer. So I'm at Patrick Air Force Base, and I'm talking to a bunch of young guys, and uh, they're, it's a Friday night, and they're dressed in you know shirt and slacks, and I can't tell if they're officers or enlisted guys but I know they're young guys. And I'm telling them that my neighbor and I have been tracking, thank you, have been tracking the barometric pressure and what we catch fishing for the last three years. And we've decided, we've come to the conclusion that when the barometric pressure is 30.2 millibars, whatever, that's the best time to go fishing. And this guy with, you know, Madras shirt on, a pair of slacks, says, uh, John, I have a question, John, uh, my name is uh, John Jones. Okay, John, what's your question? Well, actually, John, I'm a major at the weather squadron at Cape Canaveral Airport Station. And we don't shoot rockets unless I tell the wing commander it's okay to fire the rocket, depending on weather, wind, etc. He said, and I want to tell you, you've done a hell of a job in finding out and proving that the average barometric temperature for the space coast is 30.2 millibars. <laughs> and I thought I was telling them some wonderful thing about how 30.2 and you couldn't go wrong and everything. And, you know, <laughs> crash and burn. <laughs> Last one. Standing on the beach. I got four guys in front of me. I'm telling them Fellas, what I do is I peel the shrimp and then I put the shrimp on the hook and I feel that that puts more scent in the water and therefore the fish bite it. And I got these guys going. And my son, standing in the back, 6'4", 230 pounds, red beard, and in the, in the Coastal Angler magazine here, of this one, uh, says, oh, Dad, oh, Dad. And when he starts that stuff, I know that the sword of Damocles is right over my head, OK? <laughs> so, Dad, fish have been eating shrimp for a gazillion years. And not once have they said to themselves, Darn, I should have peeled that side. <laughs> <laughs> These guys fall down in the sand. I'm in the sand. People are stopping and looking at five adults laying in the sand and this great big guy looking at them. Anyway, long story short, the first liar never has a chance. Okay. So, uh, any questions? You got your sand flea bucket. Were you going to talk about oh, I'll just quickly tell you that. Sand fleas. Climb bait for Papado, you gotta 